Okay, so uh, like Dr. Mathias was um, introducing, I'm going to talk um, about some treatment methods that have been used with um, adolescents and youth that do self-harm behaviors. Um, these are the three that I'm going to specifically talk about. Um, they're actually ones that I think are um, not as familiar as others that are out there and are really um, new, I would say, when it comes to the field of, of suicidality in adolescents and youth. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is cognitive behavioral therapy for suicide prevention. And um, CBT SP is actually a manualized psychotherapy that's used to reduce risk as well as um, they try to do some relapse prevention as well. Um, so the aims of the therapy are actually to reduce risk factors that are associated with suicide, as well as enhance coping skills um, for the kids and also prevent suicidal behavior overall. Um, this, this specific therapy is actually designed for adolescents who have recently attempted suicide. So they had recently done it within 90 days or less or for adolescents who have acute suicidal ideation. Um, so it really focuses on developing skills that'll help the kids actually avoid future suicidal behavior. Um, and it also works on, again, these coping methods that they can use when they face, they're faced with stressful situations. Um, and it really tries to make individualized plans for these kids so that you come together as a therapist and a patient and try to figure out what strategies should be taught um, with the specific situations that they're dealing with. Um, so they are hoping that by making an individualized plan that these strategies will be taken into consideration more often when faced with a really stressful um, life situation. So there are two phases um, to this care. There's the acute care phase and also the continuation phase. The acute care phase is actually um, consistent, well, consists of a couple of stages. Um, there's the initial stage, the middle stage, and then the end stage. And the acute care phase lasts anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks. And it's usually um, done primarily with the patient. Um, but you can actually implement up to six family sessions when you're doing the acute care phase. The continuation phase is actually a 12-week session, and that usually includes about six um, individual um, therapy sessions with your patients, as well as up to three family sessions, so a little bit different than the acute care phase. So the initial phase actually deals with five components. Um, and the first one is the chain analysis, second safety plan, psychoeducation is the third, reasons for living is the fourth, and then finally case concepts. And all of these are done um, within the first three sessions of treatment with the chain analysis, safety plan, and psychoeducation done first, and then the others to follow. And family members are actually encouraged to sit in the initial sessions, um, the first three initial sessions, and then from there, the individual is, is the main focus. So the chain analysis. The chain analysis is um, where the therapist and the adolescent come together and try to identify the factors and the activating events that were associated with the crisis that occurred. And basically, the therapist tries to understand the thoughts, the feelings, and the behaviors that were being expressed at that very time point. Um, what the therapist wants to know is what were the events that led up to the suicide attempt. Also, they want to know what events happened after the suicide attempt occurred and more details about the attempt itself. So getting a lot of details about the before, the after, and then during. Um, and what the metaphor is that um, the chain analysis has been um, analogized to is this frames in the film. Um, basically, what the therapist tries to get the adolescent to do is to talk them through the actual attempt. Um, and the therapist has a chance to freeze the film and talk uh, more about what the adolescent was feeling at that time, what their thoughts were at that time, 
um, and try to get a better understanding of what's going on. Um, the chain analysis can be begin in, in a couple of places. It can start from where the stressful life event occurred, or you can move backwards where you go, okay, the attempt happened, tell me what happened prior to that. Or you can do where the kid woke up that day, what was going on, or the night prior to the attempt. So there's a, there's a couple places where you can actually begin the chain analysis. And um, it's believed that the chain analysis is really beneficial because it helps to select certain strategies that you're going to implement in um, these sessions that you're gonna have with the patient um, because it kind of shows you where the problem areas are. Um, it also gives you a chance to let the adolescent be understood um, so that they can actually tell their story. And it gives you a chance to build rapport as well with the adolescent. Then you have safety planning, um, which is basically writing a written plan that is always available for the adolescent or the youth, um, and it's always accessible. So it, and it tells them how they're going to remain safe in the future. Um, and it's really something that's very important to have both the patient and the family involved in um, when you're using CBTSP. So what they'll do is um, they'll discuss ways of making sure that lethal means are actually out of the home or are placed in lock boxes. Um, and they'll do this again with the patient and the parent present. Um, they also talk about specific coping strategies that are going to be used when they are faced with stressful situations and then also support um, sources as well. So again, hotline numbers, where they can go if they are feeling unsafe. And then also it gives them time to actually discuss how the family can encourage the use of the safety plan. Um, so again, bringing the family into that, making sure that um, both the parent and the child know what's going on and how they can keep this kid safe. And then psychoeducation um, also occurs during the first couple of sessions. And this is where you are educating the parent and the child about the nature of suicidal behavior. Um, also, telling them how the role of depression plays in this behavior. Um, and then again, talking about how it's really important to secure lethal means. Um, and also, again, introducing the principles and the goals of therapy. Um, specifically, this therapy, again, talks about reducing risk factors, um, enhancing coping skills, and then also preventing suicidal behavior in the future. And then the next stage, which comes a little bit later in the initial stage, or initial phase, excuse me, is addressing reasons for living and hope. And with the CBTSP folks, they basically state that it's really, really important to address reasons for living because if you don't have any reasons for living, then we need to work on that first <laughs> and then go from there to have that be a coping mechanism. Um, so we know and when we're really stressed out and when kids are really stressed out, they may not be able to think about reasons for living. And that could be a specific coping skill that is learned through the session. So reasons for living is a, is a really important aspect of this therapy specifically. And also they encourage the kids to make a hope kit, which is an actual tangible <coughs> kit that they can use. Um, when they're in these stressful situations where they can actually um, have reminders that are actually visible to them that they can go to. So a lot of um, the things that they recommended are like pictures of loved ones or like reminders of their goals. So if they want to attend a certain college, they can put the college emblem in their kit. Or if um, you know, they want to go to Hawaii one day, then they can put a picture of Hawaii. So things that will give them hope and give them um, a sense of actual happiness during those stressful times. So the HOPE kit is really important. And then the last stage in the um, initial phase is this case conceptualization. And this is where the therapist actually identifies specific cognitive, behavioral, and contextual problems from the chain analysis. 
Um, and really what they're trying to do is pick out what specific strategies are going to be used and taught in the individual sessions to come. Um, so the therapist and the patient come together, they discuss the strategies that the therapist believes is uh, good to implement, and then they prioritize the training for those specific skills. And again, it's really about reducing the risk for future suicidal behavior. Um, once the intervention is agreed upon between the patient and the therapist, they actually do share that information with the family and they get feedback from the family. So it's kind of like this give and take um, that occurs between the family and the patient. And of course, with the therapist being there to mediate the situation. Um, so that is the final stage of the initial phase of CBTSD. And then you've got the middle. And during the middle phase or middle stage, um, this is where it's really focusing on developing those skills and developing the training that's going to be going on throughout the um, individual um, sessions that the kid is going to be attending. Some of the skills that are worked upon, emotion regulation, which Dr. Mathias talked about a little bit, and a lot of those models, it, it, it's one of the key factors, regulating your emotions in stressful life situations. Um, also, monitoring your mood, problem solving skills are some of the things that they work on in the, the individual sessions. And then on the family side, um, it's really about encouraging family support as well as um, and doing, making sure that the people can communicate with each other. Um, sometimes negative communication with some of our families is something that we see on a regular basis. So having a place that we can all come together and, and learn communication skills is actually a, a great um, opportunity as well as can be beneficial for the future. Um, so again, it's about, I think it's, like I said, 12 of an individual and about six family sessions that can occur during that time. And then last but not least is the end stage of the acute care phase. And during this time, um, the therapist and the adolescent will complete the relapse prevention task. And the relapse prevention task is a technique to actually test the skills and the coping strategies that the adolescent has learned in the middle phase. Um, so it's actually implementing these skills um, in a safe environment. And there's five steps to the actual task. The first task, well, the first step, excuse me, is preparation. Um, so the therapist will let the adolescent know this is what we're about to do, introduces the task, um, and tells them why they're actually conducting the task so that they understand. And then what they'll do is they'll ask the patient to remember the last suicide attempt that occurred, and they want them to express verbally how they were thinking, feeling, and then also the reactions of the people around them once it happened. They also want to know what led up to the event and what happened after the event occurred. Next, um, the therapist is going to lead the patient through the same event, but this time encourages the patient to use the skills that they've learned. Um, so once you've learned those skills, you have to now apply them to the situation that recently occurred. And after reviewing the skills that they've learned, um, the therapist will ask them to imagine a future situation where something like a suicide attempt would occur again. Um, and they want the, the adolescent to apply those skills to that future situation. So it's really, again, dealing on cognitive skills, enhancing these um, abilities to cope, and applying them to stressful situations. After the um, task, well, the final task, uh, final task, Excuse me, final step of the task is debriefing, which is basically you go over the task you know, as a whole, and then you also give feedback um, to the adolescent as well. So that is the end of the acute care phase. And the second phase um, is the continuation phase. Um, and again, this is a 12-week session um, where it's up to six individual sessions, so every other week and then also up to three family sessions. And during the continuation phase, um, you are either teaching new skills that the therapist believes would be beneficial for the adolescent, 
or you're encouraging the skills that are, have already been taught and you're actually just helping the families and the patient get better at those specific skills. Um, so also at this time, the treatment is ending. So we want to talk to the adolescent about how they feel about treatment ending. And also from a family's perspective, tell them how we think um, the therapy is going to affect them as a whole and also see if there's need, more need for future um, treatment. So it's really about just making sure everything's okay before we say you, you can go and, and you know, live healthy and happy lives. Um, another therapy that I'm gonna talk about, which is a little different, um, actually a lot different, I would say, CPTSP is very um, specific on cognition. It's very, it's more about thinking, learning these skills and applying. Um, and with the next therapy that I'm gonna talk about, the attachment-based family therapy is more um, about attachment bonds and building these bonds that have been temporarily disconnected. Um, so this is actually the first manualized family therapy that um, is out there. Um, it was actually developed by Dr. Guy Diamond, who is a psychologist in uh, the University of Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania, and um, it's usually targeted for family, families that are experiencing um, adolescents that are depressed or have suicidal behavior. And it's really focusing on family processes, um, and it's aimed at improving family problem solving, um, emotion regulation, as well as family cohesion. And it takes into consideration the interpersonal theory of suicide that Dr. Mathias was actually just talking about. And um, also, it's really about improving these bonds between parents and children. And they believe that once you improve that bond, that the parent can be used as a secure base or a positive base in going through adolescent development. Um, so it's really important to have those attachment bonds be strong. So, there are five specific tasks that are completed in the ABSP. The first task is the relational reframe task, and this is done specifically with the adolescent and the therapist at first. Um, during the first session, the therapist will talk with the adolescent about specific barriers that they believe um, lead to or prohibit them from actually talking to their parent about the behaviors that they're doing or the feelings that they're having. So it's really about figuring out what barriers exist and how do we facilitate um, to get rid of those barriers, basically, so that they do feel that they can go to their family members when they're feeling down or blue. Um, some of the barriers that were, um, what I see on a regular basis are negative communica communication, um, negative interactions with the parents and the child. When they come in, they're not always the happiest and <laughs> they don't always treat each other with respect. Um, so those are just some that I see and there are others out there. Um, parental psychopathology as well as something that is considered a barrier when looking at this specific uh, treatment method. And after the discussion of the barriers occurs with just the adolescent, then all relevant family members, whether it be you know, parents, aunts, uncles, whoever lives in the home with them, come in and the therapist announce what the main goal of the therapy is going to be, which is basically strengthening family relationships. So it takes a little, it's different from what I think I was used to when I first started looking at um, therapies. And a lot of people, again, look at the diagnoses and try to, you know, work um, on making those better or work on looking at the social factors and how we can we actually work with those, this is looking at the family. We're going to work with the family specifically and hopefully in the end change behavior of this adolescent. So um, once that is said and done with the family, then the second task can actually occur, which is the adolescent alliance. And during the adolescent alliance, this is when the, the adolescent and the therapist meet um, alone. And they discuss core family conflicts that are linked to their suicidal behavior. Um, so the therapist 
gets to talk to the adolescent, see what's kind of going on, and then also prepares them to present this information to the family. Um, so a couple sessions, um, it didn't really specify how many um, in each task, um, but I'm assuming it'd definitely be more than one. <laughs> um, so you're getting the adolescent ready to actually talk about these family con conflicts that are related to their suicidal behavior. And then is the parent alliance um, task. And this is where the therapist meets with the parent alone. And during this time, they work on parental love and empathy. And they also explore their own family of origin. Um, so that's something that's a little bit different, um, especially when compared to CBT. Um, that was just recently presented. And they try to get the parents to understand, well, some of these issues that your adolescent is dealing with may be very relevant to issues that you were dealing with when you were an adolescent. So it kind of is the hope that if the parent can be empathetic to the experiences that they had as an adolescent, that that will translate to having empathy for their adolescent as well. Um, and also the therapist focuses on how to be in tune with your adolescent on an emotional level, so being able to understand what types of emotions are being expressed and what um, those emotions mean. And sometimes it's hard to understand an emotional uh, teenager. Um, so they work on those as well. And um, after that is said and done, when you meet with the adolescent and then you meet with the parent alone, then you bring them together. And that is done in the reattachment task. So the reattachment task is when you bring the parent and the adolescent together and you basically talk about all the issues and the conflicts that came up in the individual session. And what the hope is, is that you can improve on the communication practices between the family members, as well as the problem solving skills that were learned on an individual basis and also affect regulation, so emotional regulation skills as well that have been taught on the individual session. And then finally, the competency task is the last task of this specific therapy. And during the competency task, the therapist actually um, promotes autonomy of the adolescent, but also addresses that maintaining a actual tie to the family is very important. So again, you can, autonomy is something that we do see in, in the lab. A lot of parents want to hold on and they don't want to let go, um, which I can, I can understand. <laughs> but at the same time, adolescents have to have that ability to be able to express themselves and do things for themselves. Um, so addressing that during the competency um, task is very important. But also again, allowing them to know that mom and dad or whoever is going to still be there is really important to address as well. So that is um, ABFT. And I wanted to show you guys a little bit of research that's been done with ABFT. Again, this is fairly new, um, but there are, is some research out there. Um, this actually looks at 66 adolescents. And the researchers randomized the families to either enhance usual care or ABFT, which is the attachment-based family therapy. Enhanced usual care um, for these, this specific study was basically the um, researchers would find a provider for the family, they would set up the initial appointment, and then they would also encourage them to attend. So that was the um, EUC. And what they were looking at is suicidal ideation, um, depression, as well as um, treatment adherence, um, and basically attending the session um, is what they looked at for treatment adherence. And what the researchers found is that both groups, um, when it came to suicidal depression, well, excuse me, suicidal ideation and depression, did improve, um, but the group that actually improved the most was the attachment-based family therapy group for both the suicidal ideation and depression. And then they also saw that the um, ABFT families attended more sessions than the enhanced usual care um, folks, and 
what they wanted to do is to make sure that the improvement in symptoms wasn't specific to how many number of sessions they attended. They looked at those folks that only attended six sessions each. So those that kind of said, you know what, this isn't working out, we want to try something new, but at least attended six sessions of EUC or ABSP. And what they found is even with those folks that kind of decided on different options, there still was impro more improvement with the ABFT group than there was for the other. And also another analysis that they did is looking at specifically just the clinically depressed adolescents, so not looking at the others. And they found the same exact um, findings, basically that the ABFT folks had less um, depression after treatment as well as less suicidal ideation.